Hello everyone, my name is Maria Volpe and I'm part of the marketing team here at ILX Group. Welcome to our Introduction to IT Practitioner webinar. Just a few housekeeping notes before we start. Feel free to ask questions during the webinar. Our trainer will answer at the end of the session. If we move on to the next slide, um, you will receive the recording of the webinar. Um, within 48 hours, and but please stay until the end as we have a special offer for our webinar attendees. Follow us on us, our social media channels to keep updated on our upcoming events, and here you will also find our previous webinars. At the end of the webinar, we will ask you to take a very quick survey. This will help us to improve our webinars and have your feedback, and it will take only a couple of minutes. Uh, now we'll hand it over to our IT expert, Paul Wigdon. Paul, over to you. Thank you, Maria. Good morning for you guys who are listening in Europe and the UK. Good day and good afternoon and good evening for you guys who are listening, uh, who are listening in Asia Pacific. Thanks very much indeed for, for giving up a little bit of your precious time to listen to a, a boring old Englishman on a very bright and a very beautiful but cold and frosty morning in the UK. And I'm very, very jealous of you guys who are sitting there in the moment in nice warmth. Um, admittedly, I, I'm not, not envious of you disappearing into autumn, but I am very envious of the warmth at the moment and, and hoping that the UK gets a nice, warm and long summer. So, yeah, my name is Paul, Paul Wigsell. Um, I'm an ITIL expert and, and I guess I'm now also an ITIL practitioner at the same time. So I'm an ITIL expert and a Prince 2 practitioner, uh, UK based but travel across the world. Uh, my, my main job is to talk to people about ITIL and work with companies with ITIL delivering consultancy um, and or training, but mainly consultancy to help them improve their uh, services using the ITIL framework. But obviously having got the Prince e qualification too, it helps to be able to link it into pro project management. We are going to spend the next 40 minutes or so talking about the new, the new book in the ITIL stable of books. As you may or may not know, there are already six. So we have the, the five basic core books of service strategy, service design, service transition, service operation, and continual service improvement. And there is also the little foundation handbook. And any of you who have done the intermediate courses will know that there are also key element guides uh, for each of the five core subjects, as well as the four um, capability handbooks uh, for the capability courses. Um, I have to hold my hand up and say I'm guilty for producing some of those. So um, I should know what I'm talking about. I am not guilty of producing this practitioner book, although I'm slightly cross about that because I think it's one of the best idle books that has ever been produced. And the reason I say that is um, because when we are talking about the practitioner, we are talking about actually doing it. So the bit I spend my life doing, going around talking to companies about actually putting into action, is what this book actually encapsulates. Uh, and I think it, there's been a gap in the market, and the market, I don't mean from a commercial perspective, but a, a definitely a gap for quite a while in relation to uh, this practitioner and saying, okay, it's all very well talking about um, ITIL and how ITIL works, but actually, how do we do it? Stop telling me about processes and tell me how to do it. So we're going to, in the next uh, 40 minutes or so, look at the book. Um, and, and, and work through the various chapters of the book and talking about what's in each of the chapters. We are then going to, uh, towards the end, talk about uh, the ILX course um, and how that course is structured. And then right at the end, we'll talk about the um, practitioner exam and, and how that is structured before finishing off with what to expect um, in relation to uh, the practitioner guidance, in relation to the course, in relation to the, to the exam itself. Who is it for? Which is something that a lot of people have been asking me. Well, okay, I understand there's this new practitioner course, but actually, who's it for? Who should be using it? Who should be on it? And then finally, Maria's going to talk to you uh, about the um, ILX offers that are available for you guys as customers. So, this is what the um, CEO of Axelos, which if you don't uh, didn't know and already and are unaware, Axelos is part of Capita. They are now in response. Uh, they are now responsible for the ITIL framework. In fact, they're responsible for all of what they refer to as the Swirl product. So Prince2 and ITIL now um, are managed 
by this organization called Axelos. When you read and see the word Axelos, uh, please think Capita, because it's, it's a Capita group. So it's got a huge backing. There's a huge company behind it. Uh, some of you like Capita, some of you won't like Capita, but um, at least it's not kind of um, floating around and being managed by any government organization or any subsidiary of a government organization. It is actually being managed by somebody who who deals in the commercial world. And we can already see that because, as I say, things are starting to improve um, in the book format pretty, pretty spectacularly. So this is what's in the book. So we have the basic introduction that you would expect. And then we have this bit we're going to look at a bit later on, guiding principles. Uh, the standard CSI approach, any of you who have done more than the foundation course, in fact, that's a good point. Let's stop and ask that question. Before we get any further into this, can we just do, Maria, can we just do the first pod so we understand who, who's involved? Uh, the first pod question, please. Guys, if you could just answer this pod uh, question, it would be really appreciated. So here we're looking at the pod. Hopefully you can see that. So what's your current level of ITIL qualification? Have you done any qualifications at all in ITIL? In which case I can talk to you more about the, the I will talk to you in more detail about the CSI uh, approach. Or are you somebody who's done earlier versions of the foundation? Are you somebody who's at intermediate level? Or are, am I talking to a whole group of ITIL experts? Excellent. OK. So we've got a 60-40 split. Some of you have done foundation, some of you have done nothing at all. Okay, thank you very much indeed. That, that really helps me, really helps me in a, in a major way. So, okay, going back to where we were then. So we are talking about the guiding principles. We are talking about the CSI approach. Now, those of you who have done the foundation will possibly remember the CSI approach. Those of you who haven't done any ITIL qualification at all, um, that's fine. The CSI approach, we'll look at as we go through the, these slides, but the CSI approach stands for continual service improvement. So the approach that, that ITIL recommends, bearing in mind ITIL is only a framework, but the approach that ITIL recommends for um, improving your current delivery of services, improving your current delivery full stop, um, and the continual flow of improvement rather than being continuous, rather than just going around the hamster wheel, uh, what we actually talk about is a continual spiral of improvement. But we'll talk about that because um, that's in the book too. Metrics and measurement, finally, 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 ITIL has, has got its head out of its backside and has started to talk about more clearly about uh, critical success factors, key performance indicators, how they relate to goals, how they relate to metrics and measurement. We'll touch on that. Communication. Now, communication is mentioned in the ITIL service operation book, but it says it mentions about the fact that communication is really important to all of um, the organization, but it's particularly important in service operation. In the practitioner book, we start looking specifically at communication. Um, from early tests and from discussing this with other customers, the communication chapter is the one that everyone really, really likes. Uh, it's the one that feels they feel most comfortable with. And therefore, um, it's the one that they enjoy the most. And certainly when you start looking at the exam questions, uh, communication is the one that gets answered best. And then we have this one here, organizational change management. Now, ITIL in the past has been, to a, to a, to a degree, slightly um, guilty of um, being very, very focused upon uh, change management in relation to the process, changing services, changing technology, and not really touching on the people side. This touches on the people side. This is all about, okay, understanding we are going to make a change, but how do, how do the people deal with it? And the big thing, the big thing that everybody is really going to get excited about is for the first time ever in the ITIL world, we now actually have tools and templates to use. Now, let's not kid ourselves. In the back of some of the core books, the service design book, fundamentally, there are templates and there are tools you can use. In the practitioner book, there is a whole chapter of tools and templates that you can use, adapt, adopt, suit your, suit your organization. They are referenced in the exam as well, but fundamentally, they are there for practitioners to use real world. So just working through the book, to begin with, it talks about ITIL, how it is, how it works, adapt and adopt. Um, anybody who's 
previously looked at ITIL will see that very clearly ITIL is not a, man, uh, and not a methodology. It doesn't say you must do it. It says, here's some ideas. Why don't you adopt them to suit your organization and adapt them accordingly? Sorry, adapt them to suit your organization and adopt them accordingly. But the big part here is it starts to focus on uh, being very, very customer focused, Look at, looked at it, looking at it from a customer perspective. And the big bit is about being service orientated. For the first time um, since 2007, where, when we moved from version two to version three, there was a, there was an, a nod to it in, in the later versions of version three and, and a little bit more into 2011. But now it specifically starts talking about ITIL, about not just delivering technology. It's not an IT. You, you may or may not still think the IT, ITIL stands for what it used to stand for, which is the IT infrastructure library. It's not just about the IT infrastructure now, it's about the delivery of services. So it fundamentally talks about delivery of service. It talks about what a service is. It talks about what a customer is. It talks about being a service provider. It makes very little mention of the words, or the, the acronym if you like, IT. Because ITIL is no longer just about IT, it's about delivering of services full stop because wherever we are in the world we're all about delivering of services we're all about the management of services and everybody is a recipient or a customer or a user of the services so it's talking about that it fundamentally sits and looks at value and and how the customer perceives the value so that's that's pretty much the introduction that gets you going and then we get into this big bit about the, the guiding principles and these are the areas that are within the guiding principles so this is just the chapter headings if you like but let's let's look at them and let's be aware of the, those. So the first bit is focus on value. ITIL is very straightforward. It says if you're not delivering value, why on earth are you doing it? And this is very clear in the practitioner. So when we're talking about actually doing it, because again, the practitioner um, book is not just about the processes. In fact, it doesn't even talk about processes as such. It's talking about delivering these services, delivering these effective and efficient services using processes, but delivering these effective and efficient services. So the bottom line is keep going back to the organization, keep going back to the cust uh, customer and thinking, what value are we delivering? Because if we're not delivering value to the customer or the organization, can we actually justify doing it? And linking to that, we then move into the next guiding principle, which is designing for experience. Now, this is a bit grandiose about all oh, design for experience, but ultimately what it's saying is, okay, let's not disappear. Let's not, let's not look at and be, be found guilty of navel gazing the whole time. If we are looking at delivering services to our customers, surely we should be considering the customer and user experience, and should we, surely we should be continually and constantly looking at the customer and the user perspective. So how are they feeling? I had a lovely, lovely example of this where um, uh, one of my clients the other day had bought um, a tool from uh, a supplier, and I won't tell you who those, the client was or the supplier because that would be in, inappropriate, but had bought a tool from a supplier. When they rang up the supplier and said, thank you very much for the delivery of the tool, um, unfortunately what we're missing is the manual. You failed to put any um, uh, documentation with it. And um, and I'm just oh, I've just lost the word. Um, I want to say innovative, and it's not innovative at all. Um, oh, bum! I've lost the word. But basically, they said to him, uh, "Oh, it's that's right, I've got it now." They said to him, uh, "We don't provide documentation because it's intuitive. It's totally intuitive. Use of the tool is intuitive." But hang on a minute, intuitive to whom? So what these this company clearly wasn't doing is thinking about it from a user perspective because. It might be intuitive if you're somebody who's got 15 years in IT. It might be intuitive if you're somebody that knows how to use the service. It might be intuitive if you're an engineer. It might be intuitive if you've been in manufacturing for 50 odd years. But actually, if you're brand new into the organization, if you're brand new into the industry sector, it may not be intuitive. So there we are. So second, third section is start where you are. Now there is a genuine, genuine, um, 
feeling that if you're going to start implementing ITIL, what we ought to do is just say, right, let's forget what we do and start with a blank sheet of paper. Because if we start from a blank sheet of paper, start from the beginning, then we'll at least we'll get it right first time. The practitioner book says, no, 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 don't do that, because you must be doing something right. You must be doing something quite well. So let's not start from scratch. Let's say, hang on a minute, what are we doing okay now? Let's start from where we are at this precise moment in time and let's improve upon what we already have. Let's not start from nothing. And then that kind of um, backs up the fact that we're saying, well, hang on a minute, we need to work holistically. We need to think about not just delivering a single service, not just delivering a component of that service, not just delivering a process, but recognizing that actually strength is in the whole. Now you might think, well hang on a minute, doesn't that con contradict the, the statement underneath that says, yeah, but, but progress iteratively. I, I sort of love the word iteratively. I very rarely see it anywhere else but in the idle stuff. Keep going around the cycle. But progress continually improving. Don't try and eat the elephant or don't try and eat the camel all in one go. Let's work in an iterative way. Well, hang on a minute. Um, let, we're saying, well, let's do, it, let's do it in sections, but let's think holistically. And the practitioner book says, yes, that's exactly what we're going to be doing. Let's not eat the elephant all in one go. Let's start from a small point. Let's start with a quick win. But bear in mind that holistically it's going to work better and better and better as we progress through our journey. We've got then observe directly. So, so this again is, you might think, well, this is stating the blindingly obvious. It is. Really know what's going on. Let's find out. Let's go and ask the customer. Let's go and watch. It, it ceases to, it never ceases to amaze me, rather, that there are TV programs are, um, that we have here in the UK. Um, I think they're called something like Undercover Down Under or something like that for, for the Australian, from the Australian market, where you've got new chief execs or whatever it happens to be. And they're starting in an organization, and one of the first thing they do is they go back down to the floor, go back down to the workers, the, the coal face, the people on, on the, the trading floor, whatever it happens to be, to observe directly what's going on. And from a practitioner perspective, that's exactly what we're talking about, saying let's look at exactly what's going on. Let's experience what our customers are experiencing. Let's, let's actually start talking to them. And you'll notice then that, that when we, we move on, it starts talking about um, being transparent, not hiding things. Let people know why they're doing it. Again, as a consultant, it drives me nuts. You go into an organization, you start talking to the teams that are doing the work, and you say, so why are you doing this? I don't know. Okay, so why are you producing this report? Because I was told to. Who's going to read the report? I, I don't know. Well, why? The more people are aware of what we're doing, the less obstructive they need to be. So if we're talking about here about implementing or improving service management, let's be transparent. Let's tell people why. We want to be more efficient. We want to be more effective. We want to be more profitable. We want to deliver a better service. If you're saying that to people, there's no reason why they can't, they shouldn't agree with you and actively, actively help you, which goes to the next principle, which is about collaborating. Having the right people, working with you in the right ways, get your better buy-in, get, get a much better likelihood of long-term success. So these two link together. Being transparent but getting people involved is fundamental, isn't it? If you're getting the right people involved but you're actually telling them why, then they're going to buy into it far better. And the practitioner book talks about that, gives you examples of um, um, where that can happen. There are lots of examples in the book of real-world examples of, of how, where this has worked and what's been got what's been done. So there are, every time they talked about something, there is a little section that says, and in the real world, this is what's gone on. And you've probably seen the KISS principle before, keep it simple, stupid, keep it simple. Again, common sense, but frequently ignored. Now, I was talking to somebody yesterday who had just done a lean course, and he was extolling the virtues of this lean course by saying, what was great is we had a, a, an example where we did a little exercise, and the first time we did it, it took us 11 minutes to complete the process because we followed all the, the guidelines, we followed all, all the descriptions, uh, sorry, the um, uh, instructions. He said, then we were asked to go and improve the process, and we actually realized that a lot of the stuff we were doing wasn't of massive benefit. 
it actually wasn't delivering anything to anybody. We were doing it just for the sake of doing it. So we tried to simplify it and simplify it and simplify it. And that's exactly where we're coming from here, is what's the basics that we need to do? Let's do that from a practitioner perspective. Let's not do everything, but let's look at what's the very basics we need to do. And if it's not necessary, let's get rid of it. Seems obvious, but it frequently gets missed. Now, this is the CSI approach. You may or may not have seen this before. You guys who have not done ITIL, I'd be really interested to see whether you have seen this before. You guys who have done the foundation will have seen this before. This is a fundamental part of the practitioner. And this is about breaking down and working out what we actually need to do. So if we could go, uh, Maria, to poll two, because I'd just like to ask you guys, do you actually use this um, CSI approach in your real world? So Maria, if we could switch to, pod two, uh, to poll question two now. I'd be really grateful if you guys could just uh, tell me whether you actually use this in the real world. Okay, good stuff. So 25% so you do use it, 25% of you have used it, and 50% of you don't. Okay, fair enough. Thank you for your honesty. Um, this is, this is um, a, a, as I say, a, a big deal. Um, I'm slightly biased because a friend of mine actually wrote this, so I, I, I am very supportive of it. Uh, and not because he just happens to be a friend of me, but actually I've used it myself and I do think it works well. ITO always starts with what's the vision and understanding what the vision is. Um, if we don't understand what the vision is, how on earth can we set a goal or objectives? And that comes back later on in the metrics and the, and the measurements. And we'll talk about that in a second. It talks about where are we now? And again, that goes back to start from where you are. Don't, don't you know, throw it all out. ITO says you can't really do any improvement if you don't know where you're starting from. Do a baseline. Where are we now? How can we possibly measure our success of improvement if we don't know where we start from? We then talk about making sure that we've got a clear understanding of the target. Where are we trying to get to? What's our destination? So where do we want to be? And then the hard bit about how are we actually going to do it? And this is all about service and process improvement. Now, you guys who have done the, the foundation will probably be aware that there, or probably remember that there was a seven step improvement process. Now, interestingly, in the practitioner book, it doesn't talk about the seven step improvement process. It just talks about making sure that we have service and process improvement going on. So, so it, it's an interesting move away from um, some of the core ITIL stuff at that point. And then about taking the measurement and metrics, which we'll talk about in a second, about actually did we achieve. So once we know where we're trying to get to, we can then measure to say, did we get there? And if we did, we should be in line with the vision. The, bishop, the, the vision, the mission, the business goals. So it all kind of works together. And then from an ITIL perspective, because it's continual service improvement, we do it again. So when we're talking about it in this book, it goes into that. It talks about that. We'll, we'll, we'll explore that. If you're doing um, the course itself, we'll probably spend an hour or so actually talking about the continual service improvement approach and how you would do it in the real world. The book also, as you say, talks about measurements. And we'll just flick through these because this is quite interesting. Why would we measure CSFs, KPIs, as I say, for the first time, it starts to really make them clear. Lots and lots of companies struggle with those at the moment. Metric hierarchies and the measurement cascade, we'll talk about that and we'll see that in a second. Uh, the categories of, of metric and then linked into measurement and reporting, as linked into measurement and metrics, it talks about running assessments, it talks about reporting, and again, already jumping ahead into, into this presentation, but at the back of the book in the toolkit in section seven of, of the actual um, book itself, it talks about um, how you could go about doing a, an assessment and gives you a, um, a template of it and even a template of a report. So from an ITIL perspective, there have always only been four real reasons to measure anything, to validate what you've decided to do, to validate your strategy, if you like, or your mission, to direct where you're intended to go to, to justify what you have done, and to identify and get yourself involved if things aren't working as they should be. So that's 
talked about in the book. We then also go into what is a critical success factor? What is a KPI? Finally, we start to get some clarity from the ITIL world about what that is. As I say, there are so many companies who confuse KPIs with critical success factors. As well as the technology and service and process metrics that are in the foundation book, it also starts talking in the practitioner book about leading and trailing metrics. So metrics that you would take to lead you forward, trailing metrics you take to report back upon what you have done, and then outside in and inside out. Now that might be new to you, it might not be new to you. Apologies, I've just suddenly realized I've started putting um, full stops or bullet point uh, or um, period points at the end of the, the sections I'm sorry about that when I see presentations that drives me nuts too so apologies for you people who are who are climbing the walls because of my bad um, use of PowerPoint uh, but it talks about outside in and inside out uh, metrics again this is about looking at it from a customer perspective so when we're taking the metrics looking at it from an external perspective looking inwards and then looking at it from an internal perspective looking out towards the customer and then I've already mentioned there, there is clear advice and clear assessment on, uh, sorry, clear advice on assessment and reporting with examples within this, the last section of the book. And it talks about these metrics and the hierarchy. So you can see that the organization links through into the business units, which links through into the de 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 uh, department, link it through into teams, and then ultimately into the people of the team. It also starts to talk about the cascade that we mentioned um, about the vision linking into uh, goals, which link into objectives, which links into key f uh, to critical success factors, which links into key performance indicators, which links into uh, to metrics, and finally ends up in measurements. So there is this recognition and dis distinct recognition that actually what we are measuring doesn't just deliver the results to us personally, but it actually it, it provides input into the layer above us in a hierarchy or the layer below us if we are um, managing. And as I said, there is also this thing on communication, talking about communication. And it's talking about things like uh, reminding us as service providers that communication is a two-way thing, that actually we're communicating all of the time. And particularly, let's be honest, these days we are always communicating. I'm communicating to you, you're listening to me. I appreciate you're, you're, you're not communicating, communicating to me directly, but that hopefully will come in the question session at the end. Um, but we're talking about here from a service delivery perspective. So we are communicating with our customers. We might have business relationship managers or service uh, uh, service level managers you might call them or you might call them account managers or representatives people who are working with the customer dealing with the customer at a strategic level at a tactical level at an operational level and how are they actually communicating are they going out and meeting them face to face are they doing regular phone calls are they having town hall meetings are they just sending um, uh, emails, are you doing webinars, are you doing web conferences, are you doing virtual conferences, we communicate, let's, let's be clear, the whole world is absolutely focused on communication at the moment, so therefore it's right and proper that if we're talking about delivering best practice, we focus on communicating and we talk about communication. We talk about the fact that timing and frequency matter, we don't tell people after the event, you know, your systems have changed, okay or your systems will change in six months time. Let's make sure we have the right, right time, the right level of communication at the right time in the right me method. So it's talking about different methods of communication. You know, the poster campaign is a bit outdated, but actually still works. In some, some organizations, it's the best thing. You know, sometimes you're talking about doing workshops in uh, canteens, sometimes you're talking about webinars as we're doing today, sometimes you're talking about actually going out and meeting with the client and doing a face-to-face -face meeting. So we talk about stuff like that. And planning different types of communication, recognizing the stakeholders, that's within the book, recognizing the different stakeholders, coming up with a communication plan, coming up with um, Absolutely, that uh, a communication review, the success of the communication, how do we measure the success of communication, all that stuff's within the book now. And the big bit, as I say, about this organizational ch change management. Everybody probably remembers from the foundation course, you guys who've done it, about RACI. Who is responsible? Who is accountable? Who needs to be consulted? 
who needs to be informed. But when we're starting to talk here about organizational change management, we're talking about understanding that actually working with the people is essential for the success of whatever we are promoting or, act, uh, act, um, or implementing or actually improving. So we're talking here um, in the book about recognizing who needs to be involved, who is the right person to communicate uh, and work with the, the people in helping them work through the changes. We're talking in the book, or it talks in the book about the difference between um, organizational change management and pure ITIL change management. As I say, this is very process. It's all about the technology uh, and the approval. This is very people focused. It talks about understanding uh, about the people. It talks about the fact that we recognize that actually resistance is normal. It always ceases to, it never ceases to amaze me, not always ceases to amaze me, it never ceases to amaze me that humanity as um, a race, the one thing that we are useless at is change. And yet as a race, we strive for constant change. It's a real dichotomy and I don't kind of get it. We constantly want things to get better, we constantly want things to improve, but actually as a race we're really, really poor at dealing with change. And resistance to change is standard. So we're talking here about resistance, the impact it has on our organizer, on, on the people within our organization, and the template, section seven, has a couple of assessments, um, templates, has a couple of options that, that can help us um, in, um, I'm sorry, I'm just I'm trying to do too many things at the same time. So, so the book helps us in identifying resistance and comes through with some um, a template that recognizes what level of resistance, how, how important they are, what's the impact of that resistance, and then enables us to think about how we can deal with that. And as I say, understanding, oh, I knew I was trying to do too many things at the same time. I was trying to, to not highlight in red is what I was trying to do, so let me stop and do it. Now. So understanding and recognizing that people change and people don't like change and there is an emotional response to the change and working with that. And anybody who's done any sort of um, project management or, or organizational change management will recognize JP Cotter's eight steps to transformational change about building a, a, and forming a guiding coalition, about um, defining a, a a vision, communicating that vision, empowering people to get involved, defining quick wins, um, establishing those quick wins and turning them into a longer, more uh, meaningful wins, and then ultimately institutionalizing the change. So the book focuses on um, JP Cotter, how JP Cotter's eight steps work, and how they can make your um, organizational change management far better. And then the big thing, the tools. Now these aren't, aren't all of them, but these are most of them that are within the book itself. So we have a toolkit for a CSI register, we have a toolkit for a benefits realization review. Now if you're doing project management, you probably already got these. You, know, you might call them uh, issues logs, you might call them benefits realization reports, or whatever it happens to be. But from a service management perspective, we've talked about it, we've never actually seen it. You can see there CSF KPI worksheet, it links the two together so that actually if you're defining KPIs, it links directly to the CSF. We're talking about an orientation worksheet, understanding where we are, an assessment planning worksheet, a communication campaign. You can read it, I don't need to read it for you. Have a look at those for a second. I'll just shut up for a second. Maria, could you just be ready to, to move to poll question three, please? Yeah, good. Okay. Um, I've, yeah, and, and I appreciate that 33% that of you said definitely and the remainder of you have said uh, possibly. I think um, I think you'll find in a year's time that those possibilities are, are almost certainly definitely. Um, I know that's a bit counterintuitive, but you know what I'm saying. Um, 
I think when you start to flick through a book and you look at the book and you potentially attend, um, potentially attend the course, you'll start to see actually that's 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 gold. That really is gold. That saved me so much time. All that money, and I shouldn't say this out loud, and, and particularly it's been recorded, but all that money that you spend on your consultants to come in and do stuff, um, actually a lot of it you can do yourselves now because this is the sort of stuff that they used to bring in their little toolkit. But actually they've given it to you now. We can now use it. So that's the last bit. That's the the, the, the bottom, um, sorry, the back of the book. Um, probably the bit that's going to be most thumbed and most used in my personal experience um, and opinion because that's the bit that everyone cries out for. That's the bit people want. They want to know how do we do it. Well, once we've talked through the sections in the book and then we go actually to the toolkit, it suddenly all pulls it together. So let's talk about the course itself. It's two days in length. Well, that's not true. It's actually about a day and a half in length. The whole course itself is two days in length, but that does include the exam. So effectively, it's about a day and a half or day and three quarters. Now, as you've seen, there are quite a few chapters, quite a lot of stuff to get through. So in all seriousness, bearing in mind that we are talking about it purely from a practical perspective. So it's very, 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 very practically based. So there's lots of exercises. It takes a lot of time. So the course itself is probably only a day and a half, day and two thirds in length. But then we've got the exam on top of that. So when we say it's two days in length, I want you to remember if you can, it is two days. This isn't one of those courses where we say it's two days in length, but you'll be finished by two o'clock on, on the last day. This is one of those, it's two days in length, we'll probably be finished at five o'clock on the last day or there or thereabouts. It's most likely to, uh, it, it seems that it's most likely to follow on from a foundation course. It doesn't have to. Now, there are lots of discussions going on about this, about whether it would be most productive to follow it on from a foundation course. Yes, of course it does. If you're going to go out of the office, then, you know, to be out for a week um, and get two courses done is probably really good, good uh, use of time um, from and let's hands up from a service delivery perspective, from a, a training provider perspective, it makes sense because we can actually engage the consultant or the trainer for a whole week and, and get the most from them. From a learning perspective, it means it's going to be really, really heavy going. Now, I don't mean that heavy as in, oh my God, it's going to be ridiculous. Any of you who have done the Prince 2 practitioner course knows the amount of work that's involved in doing the foundation and the practitioner in the same five days. This is about the same. So by doing the ITIL Foundation and the ITIL Practitioner, it's very, very aligned and very similar to the Prince 2, five days. So it's five days, full on. Good, but full on. From an ILX perspective, we're obviously going to try and be as um, flexible and as um, accommodating as we possibly can. So we're going to talk about... Um, Sorry, so we have we designed this course so that it talks about st things from a public perspective and also from a private perspective. So we said this is very, very, very practically based. So when we are putting the course together, we put the course together that uses a fictitious company, use, uses um, a scenario-based company. And we'll get back to scenarios in a second because that's really important for the exam. But it uses a scenario for, um, as I say, a fictitious company and all the practical exercises are set around this scenario. So we could do that in a public course because if we've got people there from a number of different courses, it makes sense to all work together. Now, if for the sake of argument, you guys say um, we'd like to do some private courses, and believe you me, I'm always very happy to do what I, I'm looking forward to calling my Asia Pacific tour, where we come down and do a whole raft of private courses, then in essence, this is a really, really um, good lever in, in the door. And why, what I mean by that is we can do the course with you based around the practitioner book, but instead of using this fictitious company, we could use your company. So effectively, what you start to get is almost a day and a half of um, group consultancy for, or with using your own employees. So going back to that, um, you know, observe directly is actually what we can do is take feedback directly from the, the, the delegates or the, the attendees of the course in a private course just around your organization and all of the activities that we do like stakeholder mapping like um, benefits realization like metrics and measurements can be done around your organization as well 
But we don't lose sight of that. It, do, it isn't two days of workshop consultancy. It is still based around, around the, the exam itself. So we just use and we focus upon the book. Now that's important because there is examination at the end of the day. And jumping straight onto this, and why I go onto this is for the very, very first time, for the very, very first time, it's an open book exam in the ITIL world. Now I know Prince 2 have, Prince 2 have had the open book for a while, but this is the very first time ITIL has. Oh, and that's why I meant to change that. I beg your pardon, I'm, that's my fault. I meant to change that. It's not 90 minutes long. Sorry, Maria, that's my fault, and I should have changed that last night, and I forgot. It's not 90 minutes long, it's 105. It's an hour and 45 minutes, the exam. But it allows you to use the book. So whilst we are doing the course at using the book, we will be annotating the book, we will be tabbing the book so that people can find stuff quickly. Now it does follow the same rules as Prince 2, therefore what you do have is 40 choice, multiple choice questions. Now I know you don't have 40 multiple choice questions within the practitioner of Prince 2, but you do in the, in the foundation. There are 40 multiple choice questions in an hour and 45 minutes. You do not have time to look up every single answer. However, there is time to look up some of the answers, which is why we tab the book and why we annotate the book, so that it's quick and easy to find the solution. You will notice that we are talking here and saying that all of the questions in the exam are scenario based, which is why the course is scenario based. Because Every single question in the exam is based around a scenario. Now, it isn't like um, a different scenario for each question. It is the same scenario. We use the same scenario for the real exam as we do for the sample paper as well. What you will have that's slightly different is that you have the basic scenario and then for additional questions, there are extra bits in the scenario. Now, what I mean by that is that you might find that you'll get, get a section that says, okay, in your scenario, you have the basic scenario. It's all set around um, uh, driverless cars. So this is the basic scenario. And then below the basic scenario, you have for questions one to nine, here is some additional information. For questions 10 to 14, here is some additional information. For questions 17 to 20, here is some additional information. For questions 21 to 29, here is some additional information, and so on and so forth. So there are little bits of extra scenario focused around the questions. Now the questions cover all of the sections in the book, so it covers the op um, organizational change management, it covers communication, it covers the guiding principles, um, but the actual, but the actual, there aren't specific questions for each guiding principle because the guiding principles happen all the time. So it's a real, um, any, at any point in time, so you, what I'm saying is that you don't get a, um, a set of questions that this is all about metrics or a set of questions that this is all about um, communication. Sometimes you get bits like that, you'll get two or three together, but sometimes you'll get a bit about communication that makes sure that you've recognized that transparency is important. Um, you'll get a, a question on metrics that recognizes that you're thinking about it from a customer perspective. Uh, it it's, uses the scenario, but they are not easy questions, but you can use the book. The bit that is slightly controversial at the moment um, is that at the moment, and I'm, I'm hesitant to say this, but at the moment you need to get 70% to pass. You need to get 28 out of 40 to pass. Truthfully and honestly, I think that might change in the future. If you have done Prince 2, you will know that you only have to get 55% to pass the practitioner, whereas obviously in the ITIL practitioner, you need to get 70%. That said, I don't think if I was in your position these days that I would rest upon my laurels and think, well, it might change in a year's time. Um, certainly my experience with all of the ITIL exams is the early adopters get the best exams. Now, Having done the exam itself, and I will hold my hand up and say, I did the exam myself as an ITIL expert, and it did take me 100 minutes. I was being very, very careful because I didn't want it to pass well, but it did take me 100 minutes. Um, it's not quick, it's not easy to do, and it's not simple, but it's, it's certainly achievable. Um, whether they'll do, reduce the pass rate later remains to be seen. Potentially, I think they might do, 
but that doesn't mean that they won't add complexity to the questions. So I think they might drop the pass rate, but I think they might increase the difficulty. So yeah, there, there we are. That's just my opinion, not 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 um, not anything too significant. Just my opinion. So that's the exam. We do it at the end of the day, um, hour and forty-five minutes. Job done. So what should attendee expect? Well, one and a half days of hard learning. Absolutely, one and a half days of good hard learning. No questions. No, no promises. It's going to be easy. It's not. It's going to be. It's going to be good. It's going to be challenging. But the beauty of this course is it's all about actually doing it. So we're not talking about the theoreticals. There's no process diagrams to learn. It's actually about doing it. There are a few hours of evening homework. Again, if you've done the Prince Two, you'll be fully aware of that type of thing. Um, you only have one night to understand all this stuff. So we do ask that that. Um, at the moment, when we do the exam, uh, do the the course, the homework is to actually go back through the stuff that we've done through the day and be familiar with it and make sure the book is tabbed up. Later on, they are talking about bringing out a second sample paper. In fact, it's it's imminent. If and when the second sample paper comes out, there might be the opportunity to do additional questions in the evening too. I wouldn't suggest that we end up doing the entire sample paper so that you have an additional hour and 45 minutes of practice, but I would think there'll be some practice questions put into the homework. So you're talking about two, maybe two and a half hours uh, maximum of homework in the evening. You get the book. You get the book to keep. You get the book to tab. You get the book to annotate and all that sort of stuff. Uh, then you get um, really good quality, interactive, practically based delivery. So it, this is not um, a death by PowerPoint course. This is not something that what we refer to in the training world as a chalk and talk. This is, these are the principles, right, let's do it. These are the principles, right, let's do it. These are the principles, right, let's do it. Which is why I say if we end up doing pra uh, doing private um, courses, which I think will, will be the ones that will be really, really popular, is because effectively we can bring together 10, 12, 15 people of your own organization and say, right, let's actually do this. So it almost becomes a two-day consultancy workshop. It is not easy, so there is a tricky exam, but obviously there's bags of time and time to ask questions and, and get some real life hands-on experience from the person delivering this. You can't deliver this course if you haven't done it. it. It's one of those, you've just got to have the war wounds, you've got to have the scars in order to be able to say, okay, this is what the book is saying and this is how I did it. But what it will do when you have completed the, the, the course is give you without doubt a lifelong skill set for managing change, for understanding communication, for continual improvement. And again, it doesn't matter whether you're working in IT, whether you're working in banking, whether you're working in healthcare, everybody is trying to get you to do things better, faster, cheaper, and long term. So who's it ready for? Last slide from me. Well, basically, those wishing to know how to do something, not how to manage it. Those who are not looking to be ITIL experts yet. Now, I say yet because I think there will be a movement from practitioner to expert if that's what people want to do. But there, are lots of, there were lots of calls saying, yes, 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 I've done the foundation, but I want to know where do I go next to actually know how to do it. That's what this course is about. Those looking to implement things, uh, sorry, those not looking to implement new things but to improve what they've all got, but actually, at the same time, those who are looking to implement but know that there is some resistance in their organization. So it is trying to be all things to all men, I grant you that, but effectively it's saying, if you're looking to improve what you've got, this will work for you. If you're looking to implement new things, but you know there is some resistance, this course would help you and will work for you. Those who are looking to build upon their foundation knowledge, but not wishing to specialize in transition or operation or strategy or design, or continual service improvement, but just have a good overall understanding at the stage beyond foundation, this would be absolutely perfect for you guys. And the big thing that I just want to kind of really focus on is those wishing to understand how I to work from a practical perspective rather than a theoretical. As I said, this, this is not the course that teaches you about process diagrams. This is not the course that teaches you how to do change management. It talks to you about how to improve what you've got. It talks to you about how to 
to recognize what's good in your organization and, and, and improve upon that. It doesn't say go away and put this process flow into action. Maria, I think that's about my, my bit done um, before we open the floor and ask questions. So um, if you want to pick up, please feel free to do so. Yes, thank you, Paul. So uh, we have IT Foundation e-learning for a six months license for $5.99. And the exam is $285 and the handbook is $25. And I think practitioner classroom courses and the foundation and practitioner blending courses are available on request. So feel free to send us an email if you want to attend to any I think practitioner course. If we move on the next slide, uh, as I mentioned, we have an exclusive webinar offer for our webinar attendees. So if you are I think foundation qualified, we'll give you 15 percent discount on our IT practitioner classroom course. If you are not IT foundation qualified, you can book your IT practitioner course and we'll give you IT foundation e-learning for free. Uh, you can book the courses um, on our website, ilxgroup.com, just uh, typing the promo code you see on the slide. And the details of this offer will be available on our on your email once you receive the webinar recording. And um, you can also send us an email um, to this email address you see on the screen or giving us a call. Uh, I think that's all from me. Thank you very much for attending this webinar. And uh, Paul, over to you for the questions. Thank you, Archie D. Well, just before we open up the, 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 uh, the question floor is what I'm looking for the word I'm looking for. If just before we open the floor to questions, could I just ask, Maria, could you just whack up question four from our poll, please? Yes. So you guys now have heard about the, the course, heard about the practitioner course, we've gone through the book. Um, I'd be interested to know as a, res, a direct result of that, um, and if you, there's no obligation to this, we're not capturing who says what. I'm just curious as to you guys who have listened now, whether you would be um, interested or, or even consider attending a practitioner course in the next 12 months or so. Ah, excellent. Excellent. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you for your honesty. I appreciate that. Good then. Okay. Uh, this is the bit where I, I am I'm slightly nervous at this point because at this point I would like to say to you, okay, let's, um, let's open the floor to questions, please. So does anybody have any questions? If so, then f please feel free to stick them in the chat box um, and then uh, Maria, will either, uh, Maria will then pass them through to me, he said, trying to put his teeth back in. Does anyone have any questions at all? No, no questions at all. Okay, in that case, um, thank you very, very much for your time. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure. I hope you found this useful. Um, as Maria said, if you could be so kind as to um, make sure that you um, do the feedback, uh, the, the questionnaire right at the end. Uh, we'd be really ob obliged if you do that. Thank you very much indeed. Um, you've got our details. You will get a copy of the recording. Um, so you can get through to the, the website details. Uh, you can listen to me again if you really, really need to or want to. Um, if you have any questions subsequently, please feel free to send them through. Send them through to ilx.com, mark them up as um, practitioner webinar questions. Um, they'll find their way to me without question and I will then deal with them and talk to you on a one-to-one -one basis. Thank you very, very much indeed for your attendance. Uh, feel free to drop off the line anytime you choose. Thank you. Bye.